It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 218 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 13th of March 2016. I'm Ed Brown and today I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And psychologist and statistician Cassandra Perryman. Hello. Welcome back, Cassandra. You are a statistician, as I said, and so you're the best person to tackle this story that we're going to start off with, which is about a warning issued last week by the American Statistical Association Mm -hmm. against the misuse of the p-value. So do you want to begin by explaining what a p-value is, and then we'll talk about the warning. Well, the p-value is the probability of whatever effect or phenomenon you've observed happening by chance. And so the idea of the p-value is that in, in any research that involves statistics, we put this acceptable, significant probability value on it. So we want a p of approximately, I shouldn't even say approximately, I could rip into social psychology and their point one O's, but we'll say point oh five or less, which means that the odds of your phenomenon being valid are essentially ninety five percent, which on the surface sounds great, right? We sure. we reached a P of point oh five, we have ninety five percent statistical certainty. Now I will say I'm I'm really sugarcoating that. It's a an indecently complex theory for something that it should be direct and when you get something that complex for something that should be direct it shows that there's a little bit of a problem intrinsically in the theory itself and that that brings us to what the controversy and the warning is yet again right okay so so every paper published in every journal and that will have a p-value saying the chance of this being purely chance and coincidence is Less than 5%. Okay. Is it it always 5% or is this... Presumably a p-value will change depending on how... Yes, it will. Um, 5% is considered the the base value to call it statistically significant. But you'll see 0.01s and you'll see 0.000s, which of course is not actually zero zero (laughs) zero. Stats doesn't reach zero zero. Anyway. the lower the value, the more... The better. Yeah, the better quality, I guess you'd say, that theory is. Exactly. Okay, well, cool. Well, in theory. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say in theory after I've just used the word theory. There's already people going, you mean hypothesis, and hypothesis. shouting at their well, <laughs> no, p- it, it is the p-value theory. We can say theory. You're safe there. Okay. So then this warning comes about from people, uh, like scientists misusing the p-value, is it? So they're giving the wrong value? Uh, no, and that's where I, I have students who are trying to understand the warning as well. And, and they've been asking a very similar question. So what exactly is, is wrong with the use of the p-value? And the, the problem isn't that the p-value is being misrepresented. The problem isn't that the p-value is being used. The problem is that the p-value doesn't actually convey the information that people relying on it think it conveys. This is an issue in education. This is a systemic issue, especially in my own field, psychology, of misunderstanding what that value actually is and how it's only one piece of the significance puzzle. Okay. What do you mean by that then? Well, what's funny is that It's being toted this year as, oh, we have this massive p-value controversy. We had an article come out in 2012 called Using Effect Size or Why the P-Value is Not Enough. So that goes back a couple of years. And then we have this beautiful article written in 1990 by a a statistician, a social scientist, um, Dr. John Cohen. And the title of it is Things I Have Learned So Far, published in American Psychologist. And the quote is, the primary product of a research inquiry is one or more measures of effect size, not p-value. So in 1990. So so basically the p-value is one indicator of a study's 
quality, but people are using it as the be all and end all Ex when in fact it's just one part of it and there are many other things that we should be looking at. Exactly. And, okay. and a good example that I you know, try to convey is that I can have a study that's coming across as statistically significant. And we hear that a lot. Oh, it's statistically significant. It has a p-value of 0.05. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. Woo, I've met statistical significance. Now I go on and I do this secondary calculation, which is called, <clears throat> excuse me, an effect size. And I find that the effect size is a 0.1. That means that statistical significance is of so little magnitude that it's meaningless. Okay, so this is a result that is almost certainly not caught by chance, but it's a result that is so small as to be insignificant. Exactly. Gotcha. Okay. And that's obviously a problem that goes right across the board from scientists who are using it as a using a p value as a way of getting their studies recognized their paper published and also journalists who are using it to justify writing their story about why chocolate makes your brain better <laughs> and memory is good for yes. you and all that and publishers yeah. who then put forward these studies that only have a p value and most importantly to me is the individuals who are training the future scientists if we're training forward to teach statistical significance is based on a p-value. This doesn't end. You know, the students become the people who publish. The people who publish then get their article picked up by who knows where, and suddenly chocolate is the best thing ever. <laughs> well, uh, even that's a bad example. I think probably the best example of effect size uh, being important uh, would be something like cancer rates. And when you hear stories that after the Fukushima disaster in Japan, Absolutely. cancer rates uh, doubled your chances of thyroid cancer or something. Okay, well, that maybe had a, had a good p-value. It wasn't a purely chance sort of thing. But your chance of getting thyroid cancer already was 0.1% or something. Exactly. And now it's 0.2%. So it's a, a, a meaningless almost result but it's not by chance. Well, exactly. And that's this exact issue is what also gets a lot of homeopathy studies <laughs> to on the surface look pretty good, right? Oh, statistically significant. But then you put it up to Co and Steer, the odds ratio, and it was exactly what you're talking about. There's just nothing there. Yeah. There's, there's nothing there. There's no effect. Interesting. And I don't know if they're similar uh, if it's similar to a p-value or something but when we had things like the higgs boson being discovered mm -hmm. they went they were talking about being six sigma confident uh, does that is that actually a statistical term does that mean anything is that similar to a p-value or the the level of confidence would be very similar confidence interval is is a harder science version, I will say, of the effect size that I'm talking about. This p-value crisis isn't in physics as much as it is in biology and psychology. Okay. So physics uses a, an amazing, an amazingly strict significance structure. And so when they talk about they need this certain sigma of confidence, it goes into the Mag orders of magnitude more sure than the p-value will ever reach. Okay. I guess physics, you're dealing, it's mostly, it's maths. So you're dealing oh, with hard numbers. Whereas with psychology, with biology, People. things are a little softer <laughs> and more fuzzy. <laughs> yes, they are. And that's why these things go wrong is that, you know, nobody goes into psychology thinking, you know what I really want to do? Statistics. <laughs> so, <laughs> because no nobody ever says, you know what I really want to do? Statistics. Statistics. Well, Except possibly yeah, yourself. <laughs> um, and that's why I went into psychology, so I could be the one freak who said, let's get the stats <laughs> right. Um, but that, and that's, that's what creates this kind, of, this kind of crisis. Like I said, I laugh every time it comes up again and a warning's issued because here we had it by the grandfather of effect sizes, you know, Cohen himself in 1990. And the education method just hasn't been changed because not enough people actually understand what a p-value is, what a type 1 error is, what a type 2 error is, what effect size is. And so it just becomes a reworking of the system. How do you think we break that chain then? How do we reinforce the importance and, and the understanding of it? Is this a, a failure of education at some point? 
Well, if you'd like to see how, how I'm doing it, I'm at the University of Queensland every Tuesday <laughs> and Wednesday, and I will happily grind effect sizes and proper research into your head. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. So I guess maybe at a high school level it needs to be taught because I, I don't think we even touched on it when I was doing high school well, and that That is. That's your. That's the start of it. When we're talking about hypothesis testing and we're talking about null hypothesis testing, that is really the start of it. Null hypothesis testing, the very basic idea, comes in at about sixth grade. And we're failing kids back that far in, I mean, in understanding what the p-value is. So we'll, we'll teach what null hypothesis testing is. We'll t tell everybody how to do their experiment. We'll even possibly teach a little t-test so they can do their science experiment. And then they'll present it to the class. And they'll never go that one step further and actually see if there's an effect size. So we need to revamp this basic underlying scientific and statistical knowledge all the way back to sixth grade. Fair enough. Well, let's hope someone uh, in education is listening to us and uh, we'll take that <laughs> advice on board. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what do you we think? We can hope. <laughs> uh, no, it's very interesting. But you're not feeling that great at the moment. Do you, you want to stick around or you want to bail and get some sleep? I will probably at this point say uh, good evening, good night, and thank you very much. I, you know, would love to sure. stick around, but yeah. I'm not. I'm not more entertaining than the statistics I bring to the table today. <laughs> that was very entertaining. Thank you. <laughs> no, it was fascinating. And um, where can people find you on the internet, Stan? Um, I'm at facebook.com/slash cass c a s s perryman. Um, you can find me there. You can also find me through the Brisbane Skeptic Society. I'm Cassandra at brisbaneskeptics.org, and that's about it these days. Fantastic. We'll have links to them, of course, on the show notes. But Dr. Cassandra Perryman, thank you so much for joining us on Science on Top. Always a pleasure. Now, we all know that a meteorite struck the Earth 66 million years ago and wiped out many animal and plant groups, including the non-avian dinosaurs. And we know that the impact site for that meteorite is buried beneath the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. It's known as the Chicxulub crater and it's more than 180 kilometers wide and now a team of researchers led by the university of texas at austin has received permission to set up a drilling platform and start at the start of next month they'll begin drilling deep below the sea floor and into the chicxulub crater for the first time penny what do they hope to find down there they're looking for a few different things um one of the things they want to do is look at a certain geological structure known as a peak ring, which I'll talk about a little bit later, um, that would have formed during the meteorite impact. Uh, another thing is have a look at um, how life sort of bounced back after that, after that meteorite impact and also looking for microbial life, which in a couple of places on the internet has blown up into, oh, my God, did the meteorite bring the life with it? <laughs> but as I think we've discussed before, I mean, Whenever people, we go looking for life in some extreme terrestrial environment, I think the biggest surprise would be if we didn't find it. Yes. It's just more interesting what it will be. Yeah, there's life beneath glaciers, at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, and volcanoes. Everywhere we look, we find these extremophiles. Uh, I would definitely expect that we'll find them here. Mm. But, I mean, panspermia, that idea that life has been brought to Earth on asteroids and that, like, yeah, it's plausible, but it's so unlikely and remote a possibility. The chances of that happening several times, as in yeah, the multiple seeding seedings. life on Earth and then another one 66 million years ago, no, nah, I'm fairly certain that didn't happen. But, you know, <laughs> they can always look for it and do the test and see. It's very possible that there's life there that's evolved in ways that we might not expect. Yeah, I mean, I'm guessing they'll find some kind of um, chemosynthetic bacteria because this peak ring that they're looking for, which I should talk about now, has probably had a lot of sort of hydrothermal energy and mineral veins going through it. So there's probably... So chemosynthetic is when life um, metabolises something other than just sunlight. Yeah, because if you think about it, all of us, we ultimately get our energy from the sun because either we eat a plant that got its energy from it, the sun or we eat an animal that ate a plant or yep. 
some other photosynthetic life form. I feel I need to be quite precise. <laughs> we'll get emails. <laughs> we'll get emails. Anyway. Yeah, so that's chemosynthetic life. But yep. what I find quite interesting about this is that they're going to look at the peak ring. Now, it's not, time, it's not the first time that anyone's drilled into this crater at all, but it is the first offshore drilling. Because it's quite a rich area in oil, there's been quite a few prospective oil wells dug that actually are in the crater, but they haven't really been studied at the time in a systematic scientific way and there's been all sorts of samples. Okay, so they've done uh, drilling down here, but this is the first scientific experiment. Yeah, and the first offshore, and it's interesting um, because of environmental impact concerns and also just because of the poor roads in the area, um, this is actually easier to drill offshore than it is to drill on land, which I have not ever heard of before. Yeah, you wouldn't have thought that, but I guess a drilling rig you can build somewhere where you've got good access to everything and then move it, I guess, whereas if you're trying to build one on land, you've got to have yeah, good yeah, load access. Yeah, I mean, you can get stuff in on the water on a big boat, but anyway, mm. so, so <laughs> this peak ring that they're looking for, I think it's worth probably opening another tab and doing a picture, Google Images because I'm going to find it quite hard. Sometimes I think podcast is not the best medium. For <laughs> There's a good um, page from the University of Wisconsin uh, set up by Stephen Dutch that I'll put a link to in the show notes. It has some uh, really good diagrams of different craters that uh, meteorites make. Uh, so you might yeah. want to follow along with that. So this peak ring is... The, probably the only preserved example of one of these on the Earth. So we can see these structures on other terrestrial body or other sort of planets, moons and so on, but on Earth they tend to get eroded off or they're um, not preserved for other reasons. So what happens when a meteorite strikes, or a big one, is it pounds down and a whole lot of rocks above the strike or just around the strike get excavated. So the rocks melt on impact. A whole lot of stuff is shot up into the atmosphere. And what it's thought that happens is that rocks from deep down are put under intense pressure when the strike happens, but that pressure doesn't last forever. So very quickly afterwards that pressure is lifted and the rocks underneath lift up in response to that, if that makes sense. So it's like a meteorite strikes down, and then this mountain of granite from deep inside the earth, because it's punched through the upper crust, forms. But that mountain mm. is not stable either, and it collapses out and forms a peak ring. So what you have is you have the rim of the crater, which is the big rim, and then inside you have a smaller ring, which is a peak ring. And the drill site is above an area of this peak ring. Right. Okay. So basically they're trying to determine exactly how that forms, that peak ring, and, and the circumstances yeah. that may lead to I that. I think that's, look, That'd I be think really, that's interesting. really interesting. Um, they're going to be looking for old rocks, so deep rocks. Sorry, I shouldn't have said old. Deeper rocks, which granite, which is always formed <laughs> under the ground or very low, which are lying above rocks that must have formed at a more shallow depth. Okay. So... For example, sedimentary rocks form by stuff drifting down from the ocean. So if you find granite on top of a sedimentary rock, like that's a bit weird and it's going to make you think, okay, something's been happening. And here we think that could be evidence of that peak ring formation with the granite mountain that collapses down. Cool. I, I love that we can tell that sort of mm. stuff, things that happened 66 million years ago. Just by drilling down and taking a core sample and looking at the layers and where different types of rock are formed, things like that, it's very cool. It's something I loved about geology and I just didn't have the kind of 3D mind to like really be able to get it myself. But when other people brought it to life for me, I was just like, mm. wow. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating. Um, and also I, I love this idea of looking for the life. The geophysicists that are running the, the, the drilling project, Sean Gulick and Joanna Morgan. Sean Gulick said to CNN, he said, we have some hypothesis of what we will find. We expect to see a period of no life initially and then life returning and getting more diverse through time. You can assume that at ground zero of this impact, we're dealing with a sterile ocean and over time life renewed itself. 
which is very cool. Again, it's that looking at the core sample and where the layers of yeah. what life you see and where things evolved. Uh, I love is that. Very cool. Excellent. Um, so that starts on April 1st, of April Fool's Day. <laughs> oh, no, that's unfortunate. I didn't realise that. <laughs> uh, so I'm sure it'll go well in that. Interesting to see how it goes. Um, yeah, very cool. But another story that uh, grabbed our attention this week is about the Hydra. And we're not talking the multi-headed serpent from Greek mythology, but the small jellyfish-like sea creatures. They grow to about one or two centimetres in length. They basically float around waiting for food to get stung by their noodly appendages. And they wrap their tentacles around the semi-paralysed struggling prey and bring it towards their mouth. And here's the kicker. They don't have a mouth until they rip their face open. That's right. They rip their face open, Penny. <laughs> I know. I know. I, and look, I feel bad because I've always been quite fond of hydras. Um, for some reason, I've always quite liked them. <laughs> and I had no idea. I, mean, I, guess, I didn't even think about it. But it's more because one of my lecturers at university said, oh, was talking about hydras and said, oh, if I were a younger man, I'd show you how they can go upside down. And then you could watch the cogs in his mind turn as this not very young man tried to do a handstand to show us how a hydra can actually turn around <laughs> onto its tentacles. <laughs> uh, okay. So, so th there's this little stalk yeah. with the uh, tentacles yeah. coming out one end. Like a sea anemone or a little flower they sort of look like. Yeah. And they can actually turn over onto the tentacles and the stalk can detach so they can kind of move along that way. Cool. A bit like thing. From the <laughs> and, but anyway. Uh, but usually they're with the tentacles yeah. upright waiting for something to come Usually they're with the along. tentacles upright and getting stuff and bringing it into their bodies. And I guess I had never thought about their mouth. Like I just assumed that a mouth is a mouth. Yeah. But if you think about it, our mouths are permanent. So we can open our mouth or close our mouth, but there's still very much a mouth there. And it's the same for almost every animal that I can think of. Yeah. A closed mouth right. still has the yeah. boundary of the sides mm. and it's still an opening. And there's definite cell layers and there's no communication really between those cells on, you know, the opposite lips. But it's been known for a while that hydras are a bit weird. Since the 70s we've noticed that hydras can open their mouths wider than their bodies so they can smell, they can swallow prey that are bigger than them. And the mouth seemed to disappear when it's closed. It's not a permanent opening. So it has um, a ring of cells around the edges of the mouth, the, or the, the mouth that's going to be, I should say, and in the middle of this little mound can stretch and flatten to open and then they can close up later on. So <laughs> they could basically sense that there's something to eat, make a mouth, open it up, and then close it up later on. And it's quite interesting that they've got all these little contractile filaments called myonemes, which are arranged a bit like a spider web that expand and contract around the mouth that opens. So the cells don't change, don't rearrange, but they change their shape, if that makes sense, and then a split forms in between them. So, so the cells, they're usually round and sort of mm. almost 2D, and they, they warp and become spherical, and that kind of warping... If enough of them do it, obviously they will separate and form this ring, this gaping mouth. And they found this out by genetically modifying a bunch of hydras uh, so that the different layers of skin tissue would have different colours. So they were able to sort of see it in action. And they studied it and they found that it's controlled by electrical signals that engage like a muscle contraction sort of thing. Yeah, It's kind of how... Um, our eyes dilate when we are afraid and uh, the cells all kind of move and, and expand to make the uh, dilated pupils. It's very cool. It is really cool. And I think when I was reading this, I thought, how bizarre, how strange. And then I thought, well, actually, they're really little. They're very soft. Why not? Like maybe a mouth is a bit of a liability. Once you've got your thing in there, it can get out the mouth mm -hmm. and you have to – expend energy to keep it shut. Oh, yeah, it's a likely yeah. source of infection or mm. something because it's a soft, pliable orifice, really. Yeah. And the other 
somewhat uh, more alarming uh, aspect <laughs> of their mouth is it's not entry only. Um, yeah. <laughs> after, <Too nice. laughs> after a few days, any undigested uh, food is ejected back through the mouth. So it's not all rosy, but uh, <laughs> it's still a very cool uh, process anyway. And I love that we've learned about it. We've, uh, we've studied this and we're learning how that happens. And the question that you know they're now trying to figure out is why would a creature have evolved such a weird trait? But, um, yeah, it's very cool. It is cool. And I think, it, like, obviously we're quite different from hydras, but it does make me think about the realm of wound healing and yeah. how that could be transferred to something, you know, more personally relevant to me. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> but, obviously you know. we're a long way from adapting any of this to um, – humans uh, especially since the other cool thing about hydras is they're pretty much immortal uh, they don't age apparently uh, which is something that i haven't looked into in much detail so i can't comment more on that but uh, is it hydras or a different cnidarian and it, it alternates between two two forms of life a polyp and a medusa and it just essentially keeps on going between those two i'm sure yeah. I've, I've heard. Of, I know that Nidarians are always the ones that are. And there is there's the immortal jellyfish, which I think does oh, what you sort of say. It goes from being a baby to an adult to a baby sort yeah, of thing. That's the one I'm thinking. This I'm just getting this from the Wikipedia article on Hydra now. And they, yeah, we, we're here bringing you the latest research. <laughs> <laughs> um, that they do not senesce, they do not age, uh, and they're therefore proof of existing or non senescing uh, organisms generally. They're, sorry, they're therefore proof of the existence of non-senescing organisms generally. So you can be immortal, but you have to have a mouth anus. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's the devil's bargain that's that you make. <laughs> <laughs> but no, very cool little animals. Yeah, very cool. And I think that's our show. Uh, links to all of that those stories are on the web at scienceontop.com slash 218 you can find our social media links and contact form if you want to get in touch with us you can email us feedback at scienceontop.com and of course leave a review or rating on itunes thanks very much penny always a pleasure and of course thank you to dr cassandra perryman for joining us earlier in the show this episode was edited with keenness and flair by marcos benamu and thank you everyone for listening we'll be back again next week putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. I, you know, when I'm asked the importance of science, I can easily wax lyrical about, you know, we tried to find black holes, we didn't get there, but we invented Wi-Fi. Uh, uh, and, <laughs> you know, uh, or, you know, how GPSs require understanding of general relativity, which you might have thought was rather esoteric. But really, when it comes down to it, the reason that we do science is in many ways because it enhances the human experience in the same way that music and theatre and um, art does. That's, I, I, in these kinds of conversations, I'll, I'll risk quoting Richard Feynman, uh, who said something along the lines of, you know, science is a bit like sex. It uh, might have some practical consequences, but that's not why we do it. <laughs> Alan, um... Yeah, look, um, I think, it's, <laughs> I think it's, it's, important, it's important not to be polarised about these things. Keep your so mind on the job, sir. <laughs> <laughs>